solidarity. Solidarity knows. You didn't need to say anything else. It was understood. It's the big anti-communist slogan of the day. So, this is what's going on in Tibet. These are the reasons why people are giving up their lives. And of course, it's easy for me to come out here and say, could I be able to do it? I don't know. I don't think so. Just the thought of all that flame lighting you up is something that's terrible. And even watching those um, videos and sometimes those photographs is really, really upsetting. But gradually, you know, my feelings about it are changing. People from Tibet have been writing poetry about these things. They said, one of them, one poet is a really good poet from Amdo. She said, she said, I will burn myself again and again. She says, look what's happening to my country. It's not just burning yourself once. If you have to do it again and again, I don't care. And someone, uh, because the Tibetan government this, this year said, we mustn't celebrate the Tibetan New Year <coughs> because people are dying in Tibet. One person wrote a very good article from Tibet. He said, we must celebrate the New Year. We must celebrate these people's courage. This is not something to feel sad about. He said, we Tibetans have, you know, these days, of course, we are a very religious people. But once, you know, we were a martial race. We had an empire. In those days, it was considered that if you died in battle, that was the best way of going. You know, in Tibetans, when we die, we have a kind of thing where we transfer our life force and we require a lama to do it. It's called, you know, like, um, okay, I'm, I won't go into Dharma details here. But, uh, it, you know, people consider that if you die in battle when you're fighting and you die, you don't need lamas to transfer your consciousness and your, you're that close to the other world. People in that sort of thing have a, a different way of looking at it. So this young person had written this article that from today when pe if people burn themselves, he's going to make the best chung, make the best tea, he's going to bring out the steaks, the, the meat, he's going to celebrate. It shows the courage of our people and our resolve, and our resolve to fight communist oppression in Tibet. So what are the Chinese doing in Tibet to provoke young Tibetans to take their own lives in such a drastic, even unthinkable fashion. First of all, I think it's important for us to realize that um, inside Tibet there's no alternate way of protesting. First of all, there are, there's no criminal justice system in Tibet by which you can go. You know, if you're being oppressed, can appeal to the justice, and there's nothing like that. There's no free press. And these days, very few religious leaders also. Many of them are in jail. Many have escaped to exile. So there's no one even to go to ask for advice or for comfort, or someone to intercede for you with the authorities. So demonstrations. For, for a while in Tibet, the big thing was demonstrations. People came up. But the problem with demonstrations is it has to be planned. And the communists have secret police everywhere inside Tibet. Informers. Even within your family, children are expected to, you know, to report what their parents are saying in school. In Lhasa city, in the courtyards, you know, neighborhoods, there's always one informer. He's called an Amjo, it depends on the year. Apartment buildings, at the end in the corridor, you'll always see one very suspicious looking guy wearing a rather ill-fitting suit and always smoking like this. And he's another Amjo. You go to nightclubs, or you go to karaoke or bar or restaurants and this, people will just, you know, if they know that, and you're talking too much, everyone will touch your ear. Touch their ear. Then, Keep quiet. There's a year, there's an amjo, you know. So in situations like this, what can you do? You can't organize this. And even if you do manage to organize, like in 2008, they had these huge demonstrations of all over Tibet. What happens? After that, you get arrested. You get beaten, you get tortured, sent to prison, and under 
terrible, terrible conditions. There's a cell, a special cell in Turkey prison. Oh, about four feet by four feet by four feet. Can you imagine? It's a little box. If you have to live in that box for six months, one year, you'll go mad. They break you, and that's what they want to do, you know. They don't want to execute you immediately. They want to break you, break your spirit. In the 70s, when Tibet was demonstrating, in the beginning in Lhasa, it was considered a big deal. All the kids admired the guys who came out in demonstrations, threw stones, you know, and um, who went to prison and got beaten, came out. All the kids, wow, this guy's really cool, right? But then what happens? Second, third time, the Chinese, they learn, they, they, they learn how to break it. They have something called the Ankang. It's in major cities in China, in, in Tibet, they say, Lhasa. It's totally secret. It's a state psychiatric unit. Because if you want to protest against the state, you, you know, the, the reasoning is that you surely must be not right in your head if you want to protest against a system that is providing a, peop a socialist paradise. Right? So it's, you're considered uh, not right in the head. They use very strong drugs. They, uh, they even, um, even psychosomatic surgery. Even uh, I've heard you know, prefrontal lobotomies, which in the rest of the world is banned. People don't do this anymore. A wonderful, uh, extremely critical uh, report was written by Human Rights Watch on this something. All over China. That's not just Tibet. That's all over China. So it's very scary. So you come out a vegetable. So you sit on the side of the sidewalk. And all the kids come and say, wow, you know, Agela is here. This is a tough guy. You know. And they come and he's sitting there. He's broken. He's finished. He's got this vacant look in his eye. And he's peeing in his pants. So this is what they do. That's the kind of system a kind of ruthless system we have against. And but one thing that's great thing, Tibetans have always found new ways of doing things. So now this is this is the ultimate way. They're burning <coughs> themselves. When you burn yourself, it's not only uh, the fact that you're doing it for the country, but you're doing it in a way where you don't leave yourself open to the humiliation that the Chinese you know communist regime puts you through. It's done. But, and it's striking a blow. And blows have to be struck in Tibet because right now the level of repression in Tibet is tremendous. It's changed. And this is one of the problems, again, also, like for us outside, it's really hard to comprehend because it's, you know, we've been under communist kind of um, occupation since 1950, right? And also 59, let's say, when the Tibetan government left and the all started. In the early days, it was largely a military kind of repression in eastern Tibet. The Tibetans rise up, we all had guns, so we fought against them and they repressed us militarily. They massacred uh, you know, tens of thousands of people. Or it was like mm, Tibetans being sent to forced labor camps, what they call Laogai. Hundreds of thousands of people, many starving to death. But this was uh, purely a state-sponsored kind of repression of Tibetans. But now it's changed. And that's what I think it's, it's really important to realize how they've done it. Right? Or you had, in those days, you had uh, political programs, ideological programs, like the Cultural Revolution, where they made Tibetans kill each other, where they destroyed most of Tibet's art, artifacts, you know, all our great architecture, all the monasteries, over thousands of them. But now it's it's very different. Now it's uh, it's not so directly, uh, you know, instigated by the state. But there are many other factors that come to it. It's come after Chinese adoption of, uh, you know, state capitalism. 
since Deng Xiaoping came to power. It's not pure capitalism, it's not liberal capitalism that we have in this country or in England. This is a, a kind of state-directed capitalism. You know, strictly speaking, it would be called fascism, but it's not considered sort of fashionable to say that. So with this, you know, like since China's energy is now taken up with the, you know, the driving need of the day, economic growth, in manufacturing, fueled by energy and mineral resources. This is where now Tibet, Tibet is again on the forefront of a tremendous oppression because of, of the new globalization and its effects of Tibet. A renewed, uh, now a renewed push to exploit Tibet, Tibet's mineral resources comes at a time when China's demand for almost all uh, such commodities is, is inexhaustible, with China reaching to the farthest corners of the planet to source the raw materials it needs as the essential inputs of the world's factory. Earlier, China, uh, under the, uh, in the 70s and 80s, the Chinese did try to exploit Tibetan mineral wealth, but it was very difficult because communications were bad, transport was bad, so, and it was very expensive to ship it out, right? They didn't have the uh, railway line. Also, China didn't have the Western investments. It didn't have money to start uh, the mining operations inside Tibet. Now it's very different. So Tibet has 126 known minerals, including rich deposits of chromium, copper, iron, boron, etc., etc., etc. So and now a lot of the uh, lead, zinc, etc., is being found on the route of the newly opened railway, indicating that one of the primary purpose of building the railway was to open up Tibet's mineral wealth for rap rapid extraction. So that's why now it started in, you know, in, in a really big way. Seven Canadian companies, just Canadian alone, then, are actively mining in, in Tibetan regions. So I won't read their name, but just, you know, Intercitic Mineral, Continental Minerals, El Dorado Gold Group, Maxi Gold Group, Sterling Group Ventures, blah, 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 carries on. These are companies that have been kicked out of Canada because they were exploiting Native American land. Or, you know, like um, the, the, the Eskimo sort of areas, silver mining, you know, a whole lot of things which, um, you know, there, there were a lot of scandals in Canada itself. So a lot of these companies have now shifted to Tibet. But, um, and recently also, the Chinese have, there are huge Chinese and uh, companies from uh, Taiwan that are going into mining. And if, in the, uh, one of the thing is Shenzhen, you know, where they have uh, the main stock exchange in China. They've listed Tibet Mineral Development Company Limited. Uh, they injected 302.48 million into three subsidiaries, you know. This is in, in Western Tibet. This is more on, you know, like uh, towards where the Tibet Autonomous Region is. Nemo County Copper, blah, blah, Bayin Zabue Lithium Company, Bayin Gantra. Oh, and the last is Bayin Zabue Lithium Company. It's important to pay this attention to this. This is, uh, this company mines in a place with Tibetan called Chabie before. Chabie Tsaga. You know, Tsaga means like salt lake. Whole of Western Tibet, if you look at maps, it's just dotted with hundreds of lakes. Some of the largest lakes contain a lot of minerals there. And this is from a Chinese uh, report, huh? that the largest deposit of lithium is now in Tibet. And they've started mining already. So all your cell phones, you know, the, the batteries you have in your cameras, all the new electric cars, you know, hybrids, even your, even your computer. It all carries a little bit of Tibet now, these days, huh? And it's big money. So they're there. Before this, it was in the Andes. They had uh, one of the biggest, uh, you know, so lithium hydrate mines there. They're finding some in Afghanistan, but the Tibetan one is still the big, biggest one. And this is not only in Western Tibet now, you know. It's all over. 
in Amdo, northeastern Tibet, in Kham, all sorts of different mines. And of course, if you mine, what, what do you have to do? You have to 